need to uh, overstate uh, the case here, but um, you can't really get anything done in the EU if uh, one of the big three is fully uh, on board. Um, so from that perspective, any um, sort of vision that the EU might uh, launch um, full-scale CSDP mission uh, in uh, Libya, uh, that basically uh, would not uh, or could not materialize uh, after Germany's extension in the uh, Security Council route uh, in March um, uh, this year. Um, however, what the EU did manage uh, to then set up was um, um, well, to plan uh, for an agree on planning for uh, was the CSDP mission in support of uh, uh, humanitarian uh, efforts and to make that uh, CSDP mission um, available should uh, the UN actually request uh, EU support. Now, um, probably one of the most embarrassing moments in uh, uh, EU history, if you look back at this in I don't know, 10 or 20 or 100 years, will be that the UN actually never bothered uh, to ask the EU EU was ready there to sort of help um, with um, sort of security efforts to um, support the humanitarian mission, uh, but nobody ever uh, called. So if you think of this uh, famous quip from uh, Henry Kissinger, um, who does he call uh, if he wants to speak to Europe? Um, well, I mean, by now people know who to call, but uh, for one reason or another, they also just have given up uh, uh, to bother calling because, well, um, it's just not that much what, um, uh, what they expect uh, anymore of the EU. So, um, what um, did however happen, I mean, I, I don't want to paint here a completely and probably overly unfair negative picture of the uh, EU. Um, I mean, the EU did engage in at least some low level crisis management uh, activities. Um, so, the um, crisis response department that I already uh, mentioned. That established early on uh, uh, quite a number of um, uh, contacts and, and had some field missions uh, to uh, Libya, established um, uh, relations with the National Transition Council uh, on the ground. Uh, the EU uh, opened uh, a mission first in Benghazi and then later on after the fall of the Gaddafi regime in uh, Tripoli. It committed uh, uh, relatively quickly over 200 million euros in uh, uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, and uh, even though uh, that was not a major um, military operation, it also uh, assisted in the evacuation of um, uh, third country nationals uh, from uh, Libya. Now what is uh, in many ways um, particularly baffling is that um, if you look at uh, the way in which um, NATO uh, Operation uh, Unified Protectors, so the um, no-fly zone Enforcement, or the very flexible interpretation of the uh, UN Security Council uh, mandate uh, to enforce a new uh, no fly zone over Libya. Um, how this went actually, this time it wasn't even for a lack of EU military capabilities. Uh, I mean, Operation Unified Protector was primarily run by two uh, NATO members, the UK and France, with initial support. Uh, from the uh, US, uh, but it was predominantly European capabilities, uh, military capabilities of EU member states uh, that were brought to bear in the um, uh, crisis in uh, Libya. Um, so, um, and I think that is in, in many ways that's, that's one of the, the tragedies of, uh, of this operation that theoretically, I mean, for probably the first time ever in its, by then, relatively short uh, uh, history of a, of a decade um, of the actual existence of um, what used to be called ESDP and CFSP and now um, post has uh, uh, come to be known as CSDP. You could actually have done it, but it basically shot itself or was shot uh, uh, in its foot uh, by one of its uh, member states. Now, um, so there has been a little bit of crisis management, it's not been a complete disaster, but um, the only quote that I want to give you uh, to also show the degree of um, disconnect um, 
there are sometimes two different realities, one that is in Brussels and one that is uh, on the ground. just want to give you one uh, a quote on how the EU actually assesses its own role in the uh, crisis uh, in Libya. And that is, um, real stuff, not made up, comes from the um, uh, EEAS uh, website. Uh, so here the EU says that from the start of the Libyan crisis, the EU has stood by the people of Libya in the quest for freedom. The European Council has expressed several times its strong solidarity with the Libyan people and the victims. And I think that we can probably leave uh, as it is, and it's not complete uh, distortion of reality. But then it goes on, as fighting went on in Libya, the EU remained at the forefront of international efforts to restore peace and stability in the country. And even with my most, on my, on my most Europhile days, uh, I cannot see uh, how this in any way uh, matches um, up to the reality of the EU's performance in uh, Libya, both during the actual uh, uh, crisis, in particular sort of post-March uh, uh, 2012, all the way to the fall uh, of Gaddafi, and since then. The EU is really not a major player in uh, uh, Libya. So we really have to be um, very clear uh, about this, that um, there are, I mean, crisis management, uh, or EU crisis management in relation uh, to Libya is barely uh, uh, existing. Not in the sense that there isn't money there and there aren't people on the ground, but the EU really has very, very little um, uh, influence, uh, very, very few links, uh, very little leverage uh, in relation to the situation in, uh, in Libya right now. And however we may uh, look back at that and assess it in, um, I don't know, five or ten years' uh, time, um, I mean, right now um, Libya is not exactly a success of uh, crisis management. I mean, the situation there is still very, very unstable. Uh, it's not really clear where the country uh, as a whole uh, is going, whether there will be elections uh, this summer, what happens to all these militia groups, uh, lots and lots of guns, um, relatively weak uh, uh, government. So from that perspective, even if you look at it uh, from the perspective of what the EU could have done in areas where it is actually quite good, so this whole idea of post-conflict stabilization and, and state building, all of these capacities simply um, aren't being brought uh, to bear in a very effective way, uh, certainly not uh, at the moment. And I think that has to some extent to do with the fact that the EU basically faltered in its uh, efforts uh, early on in the crisis to become a major player. So they never really got a uh, foot on the ground in, um, in uh, Libya. Now, uh, moving on uh, uh, to um, an equally and potentially more uh, depressing situation in the, uh, the uh, evolving um, uh, crisis in, uh, in Syria, I think here, um, I mean, for one thing, the EU is far less uh, uh, preposterous in its uh, self-assessment of what it actually contributes uh, uh, to crisis management in uh, Syria. And it sees itself very much uh, in a supporting role uh, of the United Nations um, and, uh, and the efforts that the Arab League uh, has uh, conducted. It has endorsed uh, uh, the, race, uh, the, the recent UN Security Council resolution um, that deploys uh, the observer mission uh, uh, to Libya. Over time, and I mean, we are really talking here uh, about the deal uh, now, the EU has actually, um, if you want, uh, escalated its, uh, its sanctions policy. And uh, I mean, that to some extent does work. Um, it doesn't work in that it has stopped the, uh, the fighting or uh, forced uh, Assad out. But it certainly um, has had an impact on uh, the situation in, uh, in <coughs> Syria. So there's now very wide-ranging uh, uh, sanctions uh, uh, in place uh, by the European uh, Union. It has repeatedly called uh, on Assad, uh, uh, Assad to, uh, to step aside and emphasize that those uh, responsible for human rights violations in Syria should be held into account. It has recognized the Syrian uh, National Council as a legitimate representative, so it's really, I mean, there's a, there's a very fine uh, 
but important um, uh, point here to be made that the SNC is a legitimate representative. So that's very different from uh, if you compare that to Libya. I mean, here early on, the EU recognized the National Transitional Council as the uh, legitimate uh, representative. So you do have a little bit of a, uh, I think a shift in emphasis here. And that also, um, I think, is in many ways reflected in, in, in the fact that the EU is now calling on all participants uh, to stop uh, violence. Uh, so I think there's, um, in a way, which is also, I think, driven by the uh, very complicated situation in the uh, Security Council, in particular the role that uh, Russia and the US and China play here, uh, there is a, a little bit more of a balanced uh, approach that the EU is uh, taking. And I think realistically, if we look at the uh, context in which the Syrian situation uh, unfolds, um, sort of these um, well, diplomatic and political uh, measures that the EU has, uh, has introduced uh, here, plus its uh, commitment of uh, funding to any um, future UN uh, efforts in relation to uh, resolving the crisis in uh, Syria, I think that's probably as, uh, as much as um, could reasonably be uh, expected of the EU at this uh, stage. So I think from, from that perspective, it's also important that we, we need to put crisis management into its particular uh, context. I mean, there's no way here that uh, it would either have been possible uh, or I would argue even desirable uh, for the EU to have um, supported military action uh, in uh, Syria. So even if this time there hadn't been um, an abstention by uh, a large EU member state, should there have been uh, a UN Security Council resolution, I think that would have been vetoed um, by, uh, by Russia, uh, possibly by, uh, by China as well. So I think from, from this perspective, the context in which the Syrian crisis evolves is uh, a very, very different one uh, compared to Libya. And if we put capabilities brought to bear in uh, a proper context, I think actually in relation to Syria, uh, the EU is probably doing um, sort of the right thing in terms of how it responds uh, to the uh, crisis. Now finally, uh, let me um, uh, look, take a brief look at the um, situation in Yemen, uh, where uh, obviously this is a crisis uh, which has grabbed uh, far fewer uh, headlines, um, certainly to uh, the situation in Libya and uh, Syria. Um, however, I think it is an important um, piece of the story of the uh, Arab Spring in the sense that it is the only negotiated transition of the Arab Spring uh, so far. Uh, so here we actually have um, a uh, plan by the Gulf Cooperation Council which after lots and lots of negotiations uh, primarily led by the UN, supported by both the Arab League and the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council eventually was um, put in motion uh, last November and ended with the um, uh, resignation of um, uh, the um, Yemeni uh, uh, president uh, uh, and the election of a new interim uh, president um, uh, in February uh, this year. Um, so, um, in that sense, I mean, the, the crisis in, in Yemen has been far less violent uh, also. I mean, in, in both Libya and Syria, probably by the time they are both completely done and dusted, uh, we are talking of tens of thousands of uh, people killed. I mean, in Yemen, very dangerous standoff uh, between the sides uh, for um, more than a year. Um, but we still, in inverted commas, only have hundreds of uh, uh, casualties, not and that's not considering sort of the, the uprising in the south and the uh, Al Qaeda related violence uh, there. So, but I think what, what makes Yemen uh, uh, significant is that I actually think that the potential for, for mayhem and disaster uh, in Yemen is far, far greater, uh, certainly than it is in, uh, in Libya, and arguably also, um, I think, than it is in uh, relation to, to Syria. So the uh, European Union, on the one hand, uh, is officially, of course, uh, completely sidelined in the international engagement uh, uh, managing the uh, Yemeni uh, crisis. 
It is not part of the so-called uh, G10, which is um, the permanent five members of the um, UN Security Council, plus the Gulf Cooperation Council, but minus Qatar. So you have a um, rather complex mathematical equation here. Um, and um, these ten basically have divided up responsibilities uh, uh, between themselves on who manages what part of the um, uh, crisis in Yemen. And, um, with no offense to anybody, uh, either French or Russian, I think there are some very odd choices here. So uh, the Russians uh, are supposed to manage the national dialogue uh, in uh, Yemen, and the French are in charge of constitutional uh, uh, reform. Now, I don't want to talk about how well placed Russia is to, to manage a national dialogue, but uh, what I know for sure is that the French model, the French constitutional model, is probably the last one that will work uh, successfully in, uh, in Yemen. Um, so I think from, from that perspective, um, it's always easy to make fun of the EU and what the EU does, uh, but a lot of other international organizations, actors for, uh, don't necessarily always do that much better. That sense, the EU is not really an outlier in terms of um, what you might call international incompetence to really respond effectively to, uh, to crises. So that to one side, uh, so even though the EU does not have any official role in uh, sort of what is the, the major, if not the only show in town in terms of managing uh, Yemen's uh, position, it is nonetheless um, uh, locally um, uh, very closely involved through the delegation. Uh, so all the um, uh, interviews that I've done with um, both national delegations and, and Yemeni 